Hello, I'm Professor Russell Goldman, Dean of the Faculty of Arts at the University of Melbourne. Welcome to another instalment in my Dean's Forum video series. At the outset, I acknowledge that I have the privilege of living and working on the unceded land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders. Acknowledging country in this way, of course, is more than a mere formality. It speaks to the heart of who we are or who we aspire to be as a nation. And in our present moment in particular, when many of our usual ways of immersing ourselves in our connection to place, history, culture have been disrupted, it seems more important than ever to be aware of and attentive to the place that we call home. And in today's Dean's Forum, I want to explore what this idea of place might mean to us and the role that it plays in the relationships that human beings have with each other. And I'm delighted to be having this conversation with an expert precisely in this, in this field. Um, it's a great pleasure to be speaking with somebody who knows so much about questions of community identity, culture and diaspora. My conversation today is with my colleague, Professor Nikos Papasteriadis, who is a professor in the School of Culture and Communication and director of the research unit in public cultures here in the Faculty of Arts. Nikos is the author of key works in the fields of migration studies, multiculturalism and cosmopolitanism, including such books as Dialogues in the Diaspora, The Turbulence of Migration and Cosmopolitanism and Culture. And he's been involved in a range of research projects, considering the intersections between place, community, art, and hospitality. Nikos, thank you very much indeed for joining me today. Thank you very much, Russell, for inviting me. It's indeed an honor and a pleasure to be in your company. And I'd like to begin by honoring and extending the respect you show to the indigenous people. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm working from Boomerang land here in St Kilda East. Thanks, Nikos. Now, given what we've just been talking about in terms of your own specialisms in migration studies and, and diaspora, it seems appropriate perhaps to begin with the notion of journey. And I wanted to ask you about your own journey, your intellectual journey, your, your research journey. So what, what has got you to this place of, or this point where you have focused on questions of cultural identity through the lens of what you've called um, dialogues in the diaspora or cosmopolitan conversations. Tell us a bit about how, you, how you've come to focus on that, what your journey has been. It's a wonderful question, Russell, about the, the role of journeys and intellectual discovery. In fact, my journey began ironically as an undergraduate student doing my honours thesis and in political science at Melbourne University in 1984. The trigger point was a, a conversation with my supervisor, Don Miller, and I proposed two topics to him. One was very clearly defined around art in Australia and the role of the representation of the desert and the outback in national imaginary. And then I said to him, but I'm also very interested in about issues to do with migration, identity, how after migration identity seems to fragment and reconfigure, how cultures redefine themselves and, and renew themselves in new places but I don't know really where to begin. I've got a lot of thoughts about my family. My mother was a refugee, my father is a migrant. I don't know how to connect all this together, but I'm also interested in issues about philosophy of modernity and how modernity is a story about movement and displacement. And Don Miller sat back, in those days you were allowed to smoke in the room, so he had his pipe on, he tugged his beard, he goes, go with the vague one. And I did. And I pursued that, and that was the basis also of my lifelong project, in a sense. It all began with the honours thesis. And I remember when I arrived in Cambridge to do my PhD, and I outlined a similar kind of open-ended project to my supervisor there, who was Lord Anthony Giddens. And he said to me, Nikos, that's all very interesting, but that sounds like a life project, not a PhD. Come back when you've got something more manageable. And it took me three books to realize what he meant by the difference between a PhD and a life project. When I completed my third book, The Turbulence of Migration, I understood how you needed to separate 
a very specific manageable core project, which was my PhD, which was a case study of John Burgess writing, the theme of exile in his in his all his work. Then that book that you've referred to, The Dialogues in the Diaspora, which was based on conversations and reviews and responses that I formed while working with artists in London, artists who had come from all corners of the world. And hence it was called Dialogues in the Diaspora because it was a sense-making activity for them as well. Seeing how culture reconfigures in a foreign place was a profoundly important moment in the 80s and 90s for the post-colonial movement, for the diaspora thinking, for the black arts movement in, in, in London. And so in a way I was trying to make sense of this with other like-minded aliens in the international art world. And, and we worked collaboratively and collectively. And so I see that book as a sort of sort of joint authored pieces and, um, and a sort of common struggle to find form in a, in a contemporary world. And then the third book, The Turbulence of Migration, which was the one that Giddens helped me formulate as a sort of reflection piece, was the way in which I actually tried to bring together the bigger questions about modernity which was already figured in my early work when I sort of figured out that modernity and migration were asymmetrical, but completely interconnected with each other. So the journey was um, something that was deep inside me from the beginning. And the journey about journeys was also very um, significant. It's really interesting and, and some fantastic lessons there for, for, for many of us in how we formulate our research problems and research questions as well. Um, I was really struck by what you were saying about trying to make um, the kind of conversations that you were having with, with others, maybe working in different fields with, with artists, I think you were saying, but who nevertheless had certain experiences in, in common. And I guess that leads me to my, the, 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 the other thing I wanted to ask you was about the kind of, the kind of language that we use to talk about the, these, these phenomena that we're referring to here and the kind of terms that we might have in, in common with others. And I know that we've used terms already like multiculturalism and cosmopolitanism. I'd be really keen to hear your reflections on what the, the, the charge of those different terms is and perhaps how the, the charge and the resonance of those terms has, has changed. You know, I know for some multiculturalism is, is, is a problematic term and I wonder to what extent cosmopolitanism is maybe a more helpful way, particularly in, in our Australian context, of, of, of thinking about our, our current position. I'd be keen to hear your, your thoughts on, on terminology. Terminology is enormously important, important, not just in an academic context, because of course, as academics, we often you know, thrive on the variations and the subtleties and the, and the minor narcissism, the narcissism that comes with minor differences. But in fact, they carry great ideological shifts as well and they open up completely different terrains or guide you down different pathways. Even the word diaspora is much contested because it has a, a kind of organic reference. It's, it means the dispersal of seeds. Mm. It comes from the ancient Greek ideas that the mother city like Athens or Corinth would send out um, a group of people to resettle in another place and create another version of itself. And so that's where the origin of the concept comes from. And the assumption was that the seed would be replanted in foreign soil, but the same tree would grow. But of course, as we saw with places like Syracuse, phenomenal innovation occurred in these other cities. Greater advances occurred in these other places and tremendous, of course there was continuous links, but also variations and pride and differentiation. So in a sense, this sort of organic term doesn't fully convey the dynamism of transformation. And so diaspora has to be always taken, like all these terms, with a pinch of salt, with a kind of a, a degree of ambivalence and recognition that there is different valences that need to, need to give, give emphasis to it. As a consequence, I've sort of tried to differentiate between different kinds of diaspora. I think of ethno diasporas, digital diasporas, and cosmo diasporas. Ethno diasporas is when a sort of nation, national identity is firmly involved in the definition of the diasporic identity. So you can have a Greek diaspora in Melbourne and that Greek diaspora is very keen to maintain its links with the homeland and preserve its language and its culture 
but it's also very conscious that it's a minority in a foreign country and it's distant from its original place and it tends to have a kind of stigmatic perception of itself often in imbibing a kind of inferiority complex or a belatedness and a detachment and a not fully interconnectedness recently the this idea of diaspora has been reversed and often people who are from these diasporas who maintain these strong links also want to see themselves as, as sources of renewal and creativity. And suddenly the diaspora seems a source for building links with the world, regenerating new identities, being ab able to produce new forms of culture. So ethno diaspora has now got a sort of double edged meaning to it. This has become more um, um, potent when we think about digital diasporas, because with the advent of new communication technologies, this relationship to the mother country can be in real time. You can have direct, and, and this is particularly noticeable with our Chinese students, who are more or less in the same time zone as their parents or their friends back home, they wake up in the morning and the first conversation they have with, is with someone in Shanghai. The afternoon, the evening is also coinciding with their afternoon and evening. So this relationship at a distance is also occurring in real time. And it's giving new opportunities for people to be interconnected and interwoven on a constant and, in, and not on a delayed pattern. But the other interesting thing about these new digital diasporas is that it's creating opportunities for horizontal networks. Diaspora tends to have a polarity assumption, the home and the metropolis, the, the, the two places in opposition, but distantly and but nevertheless connected. But now with these digital platforms, Greeks, let's say again, from Toronto, Buenos Aires, Johannesburg, Melbourne, may have more in common with each other, having formed themselves in settler countries, than they do with their fellow relatives back home. So that vertical axis gets overtaken by new horizontal networks. And so this digital diaspora creates new possibilities for transnational exchange. And that's what leads me to the third variation on the concept of diaspora, which is the Cosmo diaspora. This is when you stop thinking of diaspora in a binary way, like Greek and Australian or Greek or Australian, but start seeing the diaspora as a spur, as a platform for extending your sense of identity and connection to the world, to the whole world, so that you can be connected to anyone and everywhere and to have a genuine cosmopolitan identity. So we see how even in a concept like diaspora, there's many valences and many new orientations and many new possibilities that can or cannot be opened or foreclosed, depending on what emphasis you give to the concept of diaspora. Moving away from that more organic metaphor and more to that more dynamic sense of the word opens up, I think, a much more engaging way of thinking about the world. We can have the same debate and same kind of history about concepts like multiculturalism and cosmopolitanism. Multiculturalism has a very long history in Australia, and I can give you <laughs> lots of fascinating stories about that. But um, it's true that it has become institutionalized. It's been dominated by a kind of managerialism and a sort of corporatist and, and, uh, and consumerist discourse. And to, for some people, it's therefore increase, increasingly tainted and disconnected from the more radical or creative or lived experiences of everyday life. And therefore the word cosmopolitanism has often come in to sort of try and connect more to those creative and lived forms of cultural exchange and cultural connection. But even cosmopolitanism has itself a loaded history. And when you use it with a Eurocentric perspective, it can have a very um, normative and in sometimes prescriptive kind of um, um, loading. If you use it from a more aesthetic decolonial perspective, which is emerging now, then that opens up the realm of affect, of other cultural perspectives, and the fact that cosmopolitanism doesn't have one single source, but has multiple birthplaces in different parts of the world, and has been developed in different cultures and different ways throughout history. And this has become a very big topic of interest for me in the last five years, in fact. But, um, but you're right, the terminology matters. 
And if we don't attend to these things, then we can create confusion and, and give the wrong signals. I'm really struck by the extent to which the, thinking about that, the, the terminology actually helps us to understand just how complex the, these phenomena are as well. I'm, I'm really struck by that, the, the typology that you give of uh, diaspora in particular, those three different ways of thinking about diaspora and, and that shift from the horizontal, uh, sorry, from the vertical to the horizontal axis as well. I think it's a really helpful way of, of, of conceiving of it. I, I wonder how that, how you see that in relation to the community that you've referred to a, a couple of times now, which is the, the Greek community, um, uh, and specifically that, that Greek community here in Melbourne. Um, how do you, be interesting to hear what your thoughts on uh, the role that the Greek community has played in the, the place that we, or the modern Melbourne that we now know. Um, and I'm conscious in asking that, but I'm, of course I'm still relatively new to this city and, and still trying to, to, to make sense of the of the history that has shaped the, the city that, that we now um, that we now live in. Um, but yes, how do you see in terms of that that Greek diaspora? How do you how do you see the, the role that they have played and and the, the the example or the lessons perhaps that we might learn from from the Greek community here in Melbourne? That's a, also a very pertinent point to raise um, because the concept diaspora is a useful lens for getting into these community and personal relationships and identifications. It's a lens because it makes you think about culture in, in possibly two different ways. One is to think about culture as, as a unit that you can preserve through language, symbols, and therefore the culture is that sort of something that keeps people together and binds them. That's true, but that often leads you to an essentialist and exclusivist idea of culture. Another way in which the lens of diaspora is useful is that it opens up the way in which you think about culture as a platform for interaction with others, for exchange, and for connectedness and openness to the world. Now, when you think of them in these dual sense, in that double perspective of both preserving, containing, and holding symbols, language, and knowledge, but opening itself to the world for dialogue, interaction, and exchange, then I think you've got a more versatile and more fluid and, and, and viable concept of what diaspora is and can do and how culture actually operates in a complex society like Melbourne. Now, these are very important questions for the Greek community. Um, I've been involved in the Greek community from my youth and we've been actively engaged in how it relates to the city and the world throughout the whole time, not just to Greece, but to other communities in Australia minority communities, how we can form dialogues, how we can collaborate with indigenous communities in our festivals, how we can provide leadership for new communities who have just arrived, how we can open up um, platforms for exchange with other communities and other parts. These are all important questions. And they're important questions because our community itself, our community is not a singular thing. Often we forget that minority communities, which are often seen as enclosed enclaves, and, and based on this idea of protected and, 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 and inwardness are in fact more outgoing, more outward than the mainstream community. Not all communities, but most minority communities do are more, more involved in charity and more outward in their marriages. That's certainly true in the Greek community. And if that is a fact, which it is, then we have to advance and understand and embrace our hybridity that our children, our families are mixed. They're not one thing. And therefore we need to develop concepts which really enable that dialogue to occur so that our diasporic consciousness is not just focusing us towards our heritage and, and allowing our historical consciousness to be firmed up, but is also enabling our cultural connection with the contemporary world with what is new and evolving and keeping them in dialogue with each other. Because without that dialogue, the former will atrophy and the latter will be disconnected. So it's enormously important for the community. And we've taken huge steps in terms of trying to make the Greek culture, both engaged in that global horizontal way, but also contemporary. It's not always an easy activity, I have to tell you. When we 
relaunched the Greek community building in on the corner of Lonsdale and Russell Street, which is now a 14 story, beautiful um, state of the arts cultural center. We added a key word. We said the Greek Center for Contemporary Culture. Instantly, people thought of this as a threat to our heritage, our purity, our antiquity. And it was a huge struggle just to keep that word in the title, to recognize that contemporary is not a negation, as it's sometimes interpreted, of the past, but as a way of interweaving the present with the past and building something new and important. So the Greek community building is now embracing that kind of identity. And it's building very proudly on a very, very complex history of Greeks and multiculturalism in Australia. I have to say that um, in, from the 60s and 70s onwards, alongside the Jewish community, people like Walter Littman, Greeks have been at the forefront of imagining, inventing, and defining what multiculturalism is in Australia. I've just mentioned the Greek community building, which is a brand new building now, but before that, we, the building was a rather disheveled old building, but it was also the home of the Australian Greek Welfare Society. And the Australian Greek Welfare Society was established in the 60s by two brother-in-laws, Spira, Dr. Spira Moraitis, our family doctor, and George Papadopoulos, who was a solicitor. They were two brothers in the laws. And they were conscious that Greeks tended to look after themselves more than they relied on the state for services. Greeks tended to sort of go to Greek doctors or go to fund for their ed education of the Greek language for their children, or just do things within their own community and relied very little on state support. So while they were paying their taxes, they weren't really getting much back from, from the state for all their hard work. And so these two brothers who were educated in Australia, unlike most migrants who came to Australia in the post-war period, there's 200,000 Greeks, just to sort of um, fill you in, um, um, Russell, of Greek heritage in Melbourne at the moment. And there were Greeks who had come to Australia on, the, on the, one of the earliest convict ships but that wasn't a common <laughs> and recurring feature, obviously. And, um, and it wasn't until the post-war 1950s when there was a settlement agreement between Australia and, and Europe for the for migration patterns to open up that mostly peasants from the north of, and, and the south of Greece came to Australia and, and worked in industrial regeneration of this country. Now, these, these people, were very, in, in very um, family oriented. They had strong communities and built networks here in Australia, but they were also um, very generous in terms of contributing to Australia. Mm -hmm. And what Spiro and George, Spiro Moritz, the doctor, and George Papadopoulos, the solicitor, developed was a, a, a sense that how we can incorporate and implement uh, policies and, in the, and connect to the state services so that the support to these communities would be more forthcoming. And so multiculturalism started from thinking about how health, welfare and education, and subsequently, I would say, but privately always at the forefront, culture, because literature and art was always there, but it wasn't at the front of the institutional thinking. Jean Monnet once said, who was one of the founders of the European Union, if I could do it all again, I would start with culture. If we could do it all, multiculturalism all again, I would start with culture. Now, nevertheless, welfare was at the forefront. And in that building where they ran the services for the community, George and Spiro were very clever in, into, uh, with um, the idea of inviting key political figures to see the good work that the community was doing for itself. They invited both Gough Whitlam and Malcolm Fraser. And George proudly tells the story that when Malcolm Fraser saw what they were doing, he said, multiculturalism will always thrive when there are people like you who are pulling themselves up by your own bootstraps. 
So this, you know, whether you take a more sort of social welfare approach or an individualist, liberalist approach, this was the sort of consensus point in which multiculturalism was formed, that the communities could do things for themselves, but they could do much more for the society if they were more deeply interconnected with the services of that society. Hence, translation service, interpreters, um, more su direct support for language and culture and health. That was the formation of multiculturalism. Then we move forward a little bit further and the pendulum swings in the other direction under John Howard, who always saw multiculturalism as divisive and threatening to the national identity. He feared that multiculturalism was the basis upon which ethnic communities entrench themselves, consolidate power, reaffirm traditional ideas of authority, and that is a risk to the cohesiveness of the national agenda and the development of a sort of more uh, unified nation. So he always had this sort of suspicion towards multiculturalism. But ironically, his advisor was a young Greek man who's now the ambassador to the US called Arthur Sinodinos. Mm -hmm. And Arthur, very proud of his own Greek heritage and uncomfortable with the sort of direction that his leader was taking the party, was always struggling to, how, to think to himself how we can get a solution to sort of put multiculturalism back in the center of our, of our discourse, back in the center of our public imaginary. Because of course, Australia is one of the great multicultural success stories of the world. I'll never forget going to Japan once to lecture on Australian studies, and I was shown what were the most commonly researched topics about Australia in Japan. It wasn't sport. It wasn't anything to do with our other uh, top priorities. It was about multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. And that lesson is often overlooked in our country. We ignore the, 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 the extent to which we have developed something unique and powerful. And there's still so much work we need to do in terms of capitalizing on these cultural innovations and inventions that have occurred under the broad heading of cosmopolitanism or multiculturalism. It's really powerful to hear those 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 individual examples, as well as as you were saying earlier, just the the, the sheer numbers of of people uh, that make up that that Greek community, as you said earlier on. But hearing those those examples, people who've spearheaded that um, that 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 outward gesture, as you're saying, to to changing um, the way a society operates collectively and the way it's interconnected. So precisely that move, which is not separatist or individualistic, but actually um, communal and, and collective. And it's good to hear about the center in particular as a, as a very uh, as a kind of living embodiment of that, um, uh, that, that key contribution to, to, to Melbourne. Um, I'm also struck, of course, that one of the, and you mentioned the, the faculty, the role of the universities, I'm also struck by the fact that we've now got this fantastic opportunity thanks in no small measure to the commitment of the Greek community uh, and the support of the government, we've now got this opportunity to make an academic appointment specifically in um, Hellenic and diaspora studies. Um, tell us a bit about how you, what, how you see that, that academic appointment and what your hopes are and how you see perhaps the, the hopes for, for the Greek community uh, as we uh, move ahead in making that academic appointment. It starts way back in 1984 again. <laughs> in a room in the John Medley building called the Barry Humphreys room, which no longer exists under that name, right. but was the meeting room for the Greek progressive youth of Australia. In the Barry Humphreys room is where these ratbag young Greek anarchists, communists, socialists, and different kinds of um, intellectuals met and, and talked about our future and how um, Greekness can survive in this country. We produced from that various publications. One journal, which I'm very proud of, which was called Chronicle, came from those conversations. And that's a journal that actually put culture at the front of the discussion of multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. I then left Australia um, and spent 12 years in the UK. And on my return, 
I found that the Greek community had made really positive strides towards embracing its diversity and hybridity. And I worked very closely with them and became chair of the cultural advisory committee for the New Greek Center. And we reflected a lot about the state of play in terms of education at the tertiary level. 10,000, between 10 and 20,000 people are studying Greek at primary and secondary level in Melbourne. And when I was an undergraduate, you could study Greek at Melbourne University, La Trobe and Monash. There was a small endowment that was then transferred to La Trobe and all the, the and most of the study of Greek language and culture was transferred to La Trobe in about the 90s. La Trobe was also the beneficiary of huge amount of philanthropy. Huge millions were poured in developing the Dardalis archives and and various other initiatives. So the Greeks, like I said, have been extraordinarily committed to both preserving their heritage, but also engaging and contributing to contemporary culture. And so I was conscious that Greek language studies was declining, but not just Greek, all language studies are struggling in Australia and in many parts of the Anglo-Saxon world. So was, we were very conscious about language and and the role at the tertiary level and how it diminished and how it was struggling to, to keep itself afloat. And while the Greeks had it contributed enormously to supporting Greek studies at the Trobe, I was very conscious that we needed to do something complementary here at Melbourne University. And I was particularly conscious that we think about how this outward and wider connection to diaspora and culture in the contemporary sense could contribute to the ecology that supports language studies and heritage understanding. And so I started this conversation with various members of the executive and of the, of the Greek community about how we might um, invigorate a new position at Melbourne University. And and this took many forms and many debates and many public forums. And, and of course it was very contested and some people wanted to focus more on language, others more on the heritage, others were open to this idea of diaspora and hybridity and the contemporary. But finally, we got to the point where we had a three point plan. We had had many conversations with the, the, vice -chan the former vice chancellor, Glenn Davis and heads of school from School of Culture and Communication and I have to acknowledge the um, enthusiasm and support that Glynn provided was actually um, very instrumental in terms of getting the community to recognize itself, its role in the future of its own culture. And I think that is a, it is a fantastic example of, of what we've been talking about, which is that, um, that, that commitment to the society of which one is a part, that, that commitment to Melbourne to its university in particular, I count myself so fortunate to be, well, A, to be living in this city, which is defined by and marked by multiculturalism and, and cosmopolitanism, um, which I, found, I find so, so positive, um, uh, but also be, to be dean of a faculty which has the support of members of the Greek community, um, right across our, our faculty, um, uh, but in particular in this, in this new position, it's great to hear about um, the, you know, the account that you've just given of precisely how the, the Greek community sees itself working in partnership with others um, and using the very distinctive position it has to bring about change, to bring about benefits for, for, for potentially now for generations of students to come. I think for me, that's what's really exciting about this, this academic appointment that we're going to make. Um, so uh, that probably is a, a good point at which to end the conversation. Um, Nikos, it's been great to talk with you today. It's been good to find out about your work, about your journey, uh, but also as, as, as we've explored what this means for, for this city and for this university as well. So Nikos, thanks again for, for your time and your generosity today. My pleasure. Thank you. It's an honor to be in your company. Thank you.